All right, next we're going to install our new timing guides. Which, uh, you know, these just kind of clip into place. This is our tensioning rail. And then this right here is a guide rail. Now this is what the tensioner actually pushes against up here. And that's what keeps tension on the timing chain. And then this side comes way up inside the cylinder head, comparatively. Yeah, I think to get this one back in place, I'm just going to have to remove these and then thread them back in while it's attached to the guide rail. I just, I don't want to put too much pressure on it. I might be able to finagle it, but I'd prefer not to if I can avoid it. I'm just going to mess around with it here for a minute, but I might just take them out. The cylinder head wasn't on, this would be easy because they'll just go into place. And uh, this rail comes up here into the cylinder head, so you know it, it has to go that way. There's no other option. But I think I'm just going to take these out and uh, just make my life easy. And then we'll thread them back in and tighten them down, and that'll probably be the easiest way to deal with this. So these are just 15 mil. So to put these back in, let's use a 15 mil box wrench. They weren't very tight, so I'm not really too worried about the torque spec on these. I'm sure there's a spec, but I'm just not going to be able to really get at it with how this is currently installed. Like I said, it shouldn't be really be a big deal. Let's try that again. There we go. Installation much easier this way. And, you know, much safer than uh, trying to force it in. Certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want to break brand new guides like this, so... And also what I'll do is I'm going to use some MOS2, it's a liquid molly assembly lube, I'm going to put it on the guide rail here, so on the first start these are lubricated and then we don't have to worry about potentially you know any dry run on that, so use a little bit of assembly lube on these just to make sure that uh, it runs in nicely I just got to run and grab a, a 15 millimeter wrench from the, uh, the shed, so I'll do that We'll come back, we'll put assembly lube on these, and then we'll drop the chain in, and then uh, we'll be ready to install the timing cover, which I'm really looking forward to that, because um, once that timing cover is on, we'll be able to install the oil pan and then flip the engine back over. So, really looking forward to that. Nice. Alright, so this is the assembly lube I'll be using. Uh, it's pretty much just MOS2 paste, so molly disulfide. Which is pretty good for lubricating stuff. Just gonna put a thin coating here on the on the guide rails. Like I said, this will be good for the initial startup of the engine. So I got a nice little layer going on there. So our brand new timing chain and brand new guides will have some lubrication right off the bat. So there really isn't any major reason to uh, replace the timing chains with this upgraded version. I mean the factory ones are still relatively the same length. There might just be a slight bit of stretch. Um, but you know the uh, racing chains are um, 
Privas are about 30% stronger. And I think it's the material they're using. I can verify that. Uh, believe it or not, they don't really make a huge mention, at least in, in their information, about what the primary difference is. I mean, they look fairly similar, but, um, you know, if we look here on the original chains, and it's probably going to be hard to make out, at least from this view, but it's the same chain used from the factory. Ivis makes the OE chain. Um, but the Ivis racing chains, like I said, if, if they're a little bit more durable, a little bit stronger, it makes all the sense in the world to switch them up. And I'll keep these chains as backups because, you know, they're still decent. There's nothing wrong with them. Um, but for how much time is going into the build, at least to refresh this engine and get it reliable, uh, I mean, it's a small cost to pay, really. To install our uh, front main or our timing cover, I'm going to use this stuff. It's called the uh, Dry Bond 1209. It's a silicone sealant, but uh, what we're going to be using it for is basically to seal the timing cover here and here. And we'll also be using it when we install the oil pan at the corners here. So, I mean, basically, you can use any type of RTV, um, but this stuff is specifically designed for filling in gaps. Um, so, it's so what BMW recommends, uh, we keep it on the shelf at work, so, I'm just gonna go ahead and use what the manufacturer says to use, and remove any, uh, any potential for there to be a problem. So I'm gonna put a nice little bead right here. And then we're going to run a bead along where this bolts up. I don't think you would have to redo this. I don't think you'd have to do this if you were installing a brand new um, head gasket. But there is a bead here on the head gasket that would normally seal the top part of the timing cover to the cylinder head. So there goes that and we'll be using this stuff a couple more times um, BMW pretty much recommends using it almost everywhere on this engine at least for the oil pan gasket and a couple other things but basically what this stuff is designed to do is is you know fill in gaps things like that where maybe two pieces don't um, uh, fit completely flush where a leak could occur and I think it's just kind of an extra preventative measure for when you're installing this stuff. I uh, cleaned out every single hole for the timing cover bolts so essentially those are clear and free of any potential debris. We have our new uh, timing cover gaskets. I'm gonna rely on the uh, dowel on the timing cover to kind of hold these in place and even if they don't stay in place 100% we should be able to wiggle them into place so, should be no problem getting this aligned. See just a tad bit of silicone pushing out and that's fine, it's not a big deal. But 
Seems like it went together. So what we can do now is insert our timing cover bolts. I'm going to thread these in by hand to start and then I'm going to use the Milwaukee ratchet just to run these down and then we'll torque the spec. I also clean these bolts since they did have quite a bit of gunk on them. So I cleaned them up as best as I could. And uh, you know, there's a couple long bolts, and those go in only a handful of positions on the timing cover. And there's also a handful of bolts that, remember, hold the uh, oil pan to the timing cover, and then there's two bolts that come down through the cylinder head. So really, it's just a matter of matching everything back up to where it goes. All the long bolts are pretty much at the bottom and all of your shorter bolts or medium length bolts rather here and then your short bolts are for the oil pan. And that's pretty much uh, how you keep track of it. Oh, and then the e-torx bolts which uh, come to the top of the cylinder head. Those are the only e-torx bolts. Uh, you're lo you have a short one and a long one. Short one is here, long one is there. So when you flip the engine back over, um, you know, pretty, pretty straightforward as to which one goes where. I'm going to run these bolts down now and uh, not going to torque anything, we'll use the torque wrench for that. Uh, torque spec on all these bolts is going to be 10 newton meters. And I'm just going to skip around a little bit. And then once everything is uh, torqued to spec, we'll just go back over every bolt and double check. A few moments later. All right, there we go. All torque to spec, just the way we like it. Uh, so all these bolts are uh, <coughs> M6, so uh, therefore they're all going to be the same torque spec, including the ones that come down through the top, <coughs> um, as well as the oil pan bolts, as those are also M6s. And since these bolts are now torqued to spec, and we're not going to be touching them again. So we're going to put this uh, torque seal on it, and that way, if a bolt ever moves on us, you know we'll uh, we'll know. There we go. So uh, all of the uh, bolts that have been torqued, I've gone ahead and just marked them with this uh, cross check. And like I said, this stuff dries rock hard. And what essentially happens is you put a bead on the head of the bolt and whatever it's touching, or you can even do this with a, a nut. But if the bolt ever were to move, it'll break off and you'll be able to see right away that a bolt has loosened up. Um, it's really good for that. Um, you know, and this stuff is really good up to high temps too. I mean, we've used it on brake rotors before, and uh, 
Even though it dries up and shrivels a little bit, it doesn't come off unless the bolt physically moves. So, if you ever want to be able to visually ensure that nothing has ever moved, this is the stuff you need. It's a little bit, it's a little bit pricey per tube, but it removes uh, guesswork later on. And if you wanted to get fancy, you could even, I don't know, you could color code bolts, because they make the stuff in different colors. Um, so you can even color code by torque spec if you wanted to. Um, so there's a lot of different possibilities and different things that you can do with this. But like I said, the stuff is really good for just being able to visually identify whether uh, you've had any movement. And, uh, you know, the stuff holds up a long time too. So definitely worth having if you do any kind of engine work or suspension work. Uh, much better than paint marking as far as I'm concerned.